so great that you're here. Thank you for joining us. And it sounds like Vern's new. I hope there's other new people. Please uh, ask a lot of questions and stick around for the discussion afterwards. We have a lot of fun with these. So just a quick thought. I'm, I work at a 50 person organization and they do something that I think is just genius, honestly. Like everybody's encouraged to notice their colleagues, notice something good they do. And every once in a while, write them a two to three sentence uh, thank you and email it to them and CC the human resources department. And we have a drawing every year and one of those people gets an extra vacation day. And of course the vacation day is a draw, right? Like, but what's really awesome is people's reaction when they get these things. Like, I don't know, think about like, if you got three sentences about how you just did something awesome and maybe it's nothing you even, you know, you consider it to be sort of a normal thing. Does that make your day or does that like make your week? It's awesome. So uh, toast for tonight is a challenge. Let's all try and do something nice in an unexpected way for someone in the next week. Cheers. <laughs> so we have a really exciting project tonight. Um, this was the FIAS 2021 best overall project. And I am I work in affordable housing and have, so I'm super excited about it because it's for, uh, 50 units, affordable housing, four stories, including a library. So really exciting to hear the details. Uh, we have a great team of people talking tonight. So Emma Cubitt, who's a, the architect in Vizu Architects, Greg Laskin, who's the Passive House Consultant from Zahn Engineering, and Graham Cubitt of Indwell, who I understand, I think I didn't come earlier, so I'm not quite sure, but it sounds like they helped finance it and they're some kind of nonprofit. I'm sure they'll tell us our story, but welcome and we're so excited to hear the details. Okay, so I'll start off with the first couple of slides. Graham Cubitt is my name and I'm the Director of Projects and Development with Indwell. Uh, we are a charity based in Hamilton, Ontario, but serving uh, communities across Southern Ontario, uh, providing uh, affordable housing and supportive housing to people who, many of whom live with a mental health issue or other kinds of disabilities, uh, but all of our tenants have a low and fixed income. And so the affordability has always been key to us in developing our projects. Uh, I'll briefly highlight sort of the arc of our journey, and then we'll talk, talk specifically about one of our projects, McQuest and Lofts. But uh, 10 years ago, we opened uh, our first sort of multi-residential, larger scale project. Before that, we just sort of owned, you know, multi-residential buildings that were built in the 60s or small group homes. But we turned this bar into a, into a new uh, three-story building and had 46 apartments shooting for about 40% better than code. That was our first experience of trying to do something related to energy efficiency, but, uh, and it was actually quite successful. The next attempt we made was to convert an old uh, industrial building, a factory that had been vacant for about 20 years uh, into 54 apartments. Since then we've added another uh, 26 units. So it's a total of 80 tenants living there. And uh, in that building, we tried geothermal off of uh, an open loop ground source heat pump uh, running off of uh, an aquifer under, under that city. So that's a, an interesting experiment and it's actually worked out very well. Uh, but again, trying to push ourselves towards energy efficiency new, using the best knowledge that we had at the time. 2015 was when that was. 2016, we opened a, a new construction building, our first time building a new multi-residential building and told our uh, design team, you know, these are what we're shooting for. Everybody was like, yep, 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 all on board. Our architects paid attention, our structural engineers paid attention. Our mechanical engineer said yes to everything we asked for and then said, well, we do it all the time like this on Toronto condos. And uh, we ended up with a building that didn't perform nearly like we'd hoped uh, or thought we'd designed. So that was also a learning curve along the way. In uh, the next photo there, we, uh, we realized like, okay, if we're gonna make a big change, we actually need to uh, rethink from the ground up how we're doing uh, energy efficiency and we had, by that point had enough experience working with our design team excluding that mechanical contractor I was talking about uh, <laughs> to say you know we we like working with all of you from the contractor to the design team to uh, you know our, our in-house group you know if we step back and want to relearn or want to shoot for these very low energy targets to the goal of becoming GHG free what are we going to need to do and can we set aside everything that we know or at least this, you know, well, we've always done it that way attitude and focus on relearning from the ground up. And so we did that. Our team joined, uh, you know, we sat on the same side of the table in a sense and said, okay, we're going to learn forward and, uh, and did so uh, starting with this project. 
Parkdale Landing, which was a, a retrofit of an old nightclub bar rooming house complex uh, using the uh, Enerfit standard from uh, PHI, turned into 57. You can see what it looked like on the bottom right. Yeah, it's, it was it's a really complete ugly. dive. Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, when the demo contractor says it's in their top 10 worst projects that they've seen, uh, you know that uh, you've got a real piece of work on your hands. But in the end, it's 57 studio apartments uh, providing a, an enhanced level of support for tenants who've been homeless, uh, combined with some ground floor commercial and even a, a, commu a community uh, or a neighborhood food hub and culinary kitchen, uh, a culinary academy in a commercial kitchen on the ground floor there. So uh, a lot of learning from that project uh, along the way for sure. Uh, that's the first part of a site called Parkdale Landing that uh, McQuest and Lofts is on. But uh, Emma, I'm not sure which slide I'm supposed to finish on, if it's this one or- Oh, keep going. Keep going, okay. <laughs> um, as part of that journey though, committing to Passive House, we said that we were designing multiple projects at the same time and needed to sort of learn simultaneously or like at least in very short succession with quite a bit of overlap. This project was, a, uh, it was our third project designed, but our second project constructed. It was 34 uh, one bedroom apartment uh, with quite a bit of amenity space for tenants, uh, but we used um, a prefabricated system called BuildSmart uh, as part of that as part of that project, and really trying to again push ourselves to learn on the fly and incorporate everything we could from that one into our next project, uh, which was designed. Uh, oh, there's another photo there. Actually, that's interesting. That photo there, you can see the solar uh, panel array there. The building was designed to be 69 percent more energy efficient than code and actually generate 67% uh, of its, uh, of its no, 69% better than code, 67% uh, reduction in GHG emissions and actually be um, electricity positive uh, based on the consumption projections for that building. Uh, so that was, that was a, a lot of learning in one site. And you can see there was a, a conversion or a, a rebuilding of a building where there had been an old group home. So we were also dealing with a very constricted site. Um, in yeah. the end, this building just got um, certified uh, with PHI for a low energy building, but I bet we could have gotten better than that because they didn't end up plugging in all the refrigerators in the kitchen. <laughs> That's right. But say love you. And then this project here uh, was, our, was our fourth pro or third project to a Passive House standard, uh, Passive House uh, PHI, Passive House Institute, and, um, and just got certificate, well, it's just pending certification. We're just in the final throes of that. It's been open for a year now uh, and uh, has 45 apartments, but also on this building, half of the square footage, about 30,000 square feet of church space with a large gathering hall, community kitchens, offices, and a 500 seat auditorium, uh, auditorium gymnasium. Uh, for the church facilities. So it's a, uh, it was a large scale project. It was our second project through design, but uh, the third project finished. And so many of the things that we were able to learn in the first two projects were incorporated into this one as we moved through construction. Um, and then that, that project opened in 2020, uh, 2020. And then in 2021, uh, we are thankful to open um, McQuest and Lofts, which is the project we're gonna talk about tonight. And uh, it's in the background there. Uh, you can see part of it. And that one was to the PHI or PS standard and uh, got certified uh, three months after opening. Um, last February, we got certification for that project. So um, I'll pass All it right. over to Emma now. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to share some of the uh, construction photos that we've put together. Uh, so you can see the progression of this project. Um, uh, as we went through the different phases. And um, then Greg's going to talk more about the technical parts of, um, he was our pest house consultant for this and really helped to guide the team um, beyond what we had learned in our first three projects to really like tighten up what we were doing and be able, able to create a building that I think would be very replicable. Um, so you can see the um, one thing that we changed in our detailing is how we were doing foundations. And then this one, we have regular footings. Um, but in the earlier projects, we were wrapping the insulation all the way around the footings and underneath. 
um, which is just a lot more work. So on this project, we modeled it so that we could just go to the top of the footing. Um, just a few things that were small differences that made it easier for contractors. And we've kind of used that going forward. Um, but each time we do model it to make sure that we're within where we want to be. Um, this project was all pretty much all wood construction, except for a few shafts and um, shear walls. Um, so you can see that going up here. Sorry, it's slow. <laughs> um, one interesting thing we did was uh, we've started using zip boards. Um, I know it's very common in the States, but in Canada, not as much. Um, but we had learned about them by using the Build Smart system on the project before this, uh, where it was all prefab wall panels all the way to the pest house windows and um, then brought onto site. And we realized that we really liked having that weather barrier um, integrated into the wall system. Um, and we also really liked on that project how we had. Um, two by six studs with the mineral wool bats. And then the air barrier was the zip board sheathing. And then outside of that, we had several inches of insulation. Um, it's kind of changed on different projects depending on um, other factors in the design. But um, I think on this project, we had three inches on the outside and now we've moved to using four inches more often. Is that right, right, Greg? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, I like this on the photo. outside of the sheathing, but when we have um, stairwells, then we'll have um, six inches on the outside yeah. because of the connectivity. I like this photo, Emma, because it's like an energy modeler's dream. There's no windows. So I got my yeah. way on this project. <laughs> <laughs> we were worried when people were driving by and they think like, what is this? <laughs> That's housing. So a um, few more pictures of things coming together. Uh, so you can see the um, uh, we, we started with more complicated details around windows on our earlier projects and we had fiberglass angles that were supporting windows that were sticking outside of the structure, um, things like that, but then um, began using um, plywood bucks and on in these projects, you can see where we um, used a uh, what's it called viscon um, to um, do an air barrier seal around it. Actually, on more recent projects, we've been using a membrane instead to do the same thing. Um, just trying to see what can be kind of easier <laughs> and more cost effective for our contractors. Um, another thing, uh, the, the picture on the bottom right shows how we have, I think it's one inch of interior insulation that goes over the jams of the window. Um, and while um, we actually on our first projects had both exterior and interior um, over insulation and by doing thermal models um, on those projects realized that we got more bang for our buck by doing it on the inside and it was also a lot easier for them to install. So we've, um, um, and it also didn't um, conflict with different types of windows that we would work with that would have um, weeping um, holes and stuff like that. So we've moved to having interior insulation and making sure that the hinges of whatever window we end up using uh, will work with that. So you can actually see the middle picture. Um, this is a Veda window, which is out of Poland. And um, we've been really happy with these beautiful wood windows, but um, because of the way the hinges work, we ended up hinging in the middle so that you don't have any problems when you're working on the jams. Um, also on earlier projects, we were doing the air sealing from the outside of the window and kind of going around the bucks and realized that was a lot of work. So now we've been sealing from the inside. Um, here you can see punched windows happening and um, how they're overhanging into um, partially into the layer of the exterior insulation. Um, we also have uh, balconies in this project, which are common balconies for each floor um, for the tenants and it has self-supported structure. More progress moving up. This is the common room on the top floor. Um, it has some very nice views and um, next one is 
Uh, so this is how we were doing the exterior insulation and we've actually replicated this wall system on the next, I don't know, half dozen projects that we've been yeah. working on. And um, yeah, 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 10 projects. Um, because um, we know that um, we've we found the type of fasteners that work well with the um, furring, found the kind of most cost effective, but um, uh, type of strapping that we're comfortable is going to be able to um, be partially outdoors, but still be able to um, withstand the weather. Um, what else do I say about this? Sometimes we've had to do double strapping when we have um, like fiber cement panel, but on this project, we were using a very cost effective cladding, um, which was corrugated metal. Um, looks like shipping containers because we were trying to replicate some of the um, industrial sector that this um, project is right next to in gritty um, industrial North End Hamilton. So um, anyway, so we, we could just have the, the horizontal fasteners and then the drainage was behind. Um, we ended up using Comfort Board 110 on um, our projects going forward um, because it's got extra rigidity so that um, it'd be easier for the siding to go on and um, kind of hold its form. So here's the project coming together. You can start to see the shipping container look a bit. Um, Greg, maybe you can speak to the mechanical systems, not my forte as much. Sure, yeah, I am happy to do that. So the ventilation system is a central system and there's a two Swagon ERVs that um, provide ventilation to the all the rooms in the building and um, they do have VRF post heating and, and cooling on them as well um, to temper that air before they get supplied to each space and then the main heating and cooling system for the building is a VRF system and, and I'll talk a bit about that later on but in, in the rooms themselves they're, they're small rooms um, they just have a ductless mini split and uh, in, in different spaces like the common area uh, Emma had mentioned or the library there's uh, ducted fan coils and this project, it was a number of years ago when it was designed that we were still in the air when we were using natural gas, hot water heating. And that is something that Indwell has really made it clear they do not want to do moving forward. So we are trying new things, but this was one of the last natural gas uh, central water heating systems that, that you guys did. Great, thanks. <laughs> um, so just a few more pictures of the completed project. And um, then Greg will be able to share more of the technical aspects to the project. Um, the, there's actually a, an Indigenous partner that Indwell had uh, for this project that does placement of some of the tenants. So we uh, used that, um, um, the design ethics, I guess, of the local Indigenous community and some of the landscaping that we created. Here's a um, living room, typical living room and a typical kitchen coming up. Sorry, I don't know why it's so slow. Oh, shoot, Hey, kitchen. <laughs> um, here's the ground floor library. It's just a little branch library. Um, and their um, first pest house library in Canada, I think. It's a bit of the, about the rooftop solar that we have on this project. And yeah, we're so happy to be able to win this amazing award for the project and hope it's something that can be really replicated in other communities. So um, going forward, we have a ton of projects um, that are currently under construction and just as many that are uh, in various stages of design right now for Indwell specifically. And um, we've also, my firm has been able to um, grow to design for lots of other, especially nonprofit housing organizations um, to Passive House too, which is amazing. So a few of the projects here, um, for those that are familiar with Ontario, it's all across Southern Ontario. And um, we actually have four projects that are gonna be getting occupancy this spring. So we'll be able to continue to um, share the Passive House love with those tenants and um, monitor them and study them and hopefully learn from them so we can keep making these projects that much better. Um, and 
And so we just had five takeaways, kind of high level takeaways that Graham and I have shared in other talks. Um, one would be willingness, willing and trusting partnerships are key. Um, you can see that in the, the team that we were doing the initial passive house training with. We're pretty much the same team now. We've kind of been um, grow, learning and growing together uh, for most of these end well projects. Um, however, we want to also work with others so that we can um, kind of teach them too and have the, this movement be able to grow. Um, the learning curve can be a big one to overcome in the first project, but it gets easier over time. Um, uh, it's a great tool to meet low carbon targets. And we've certainly learned that um, as we've gotten off gas on the um, last um, several projects. Um, also a great tool, at least in Canada, for the type of funding that Indwell's been able to um, get from the federal government for these projects. Um, uh, past costs can be cost competitive. Um, on our slides, we were sharing the cost per square foot. And um, while it's very regional and um, there's been so much escalation over the last few years, it's really hard to be able to um, compare costs uh, when we do with other market um, contractors that are willing to sell, <laughs> to share their numbers. Um, we know that it's, it's pretty darn close. Um, we actually had an NRCAN study done that showed about a 5% um, increase, four to 5% increase. Um, and, and we believe that to be true. Um, and monitoring is key. So Greg's going to share a bit more about how that's been going too. Great. Thanks, Emma. So I just thought I would kind of close up the, the presentation and maybe add a few interesting little ideas we could talk about in the QA. But uh, by adding five kind of lessons learned that I've had going along with uh, the journey with Emma and Graham. Um, some of these are going to be pretty obvious, but there's a lot behind them. And so I thought I'd just mention them. Uh, one of the really cool things about working with this group is that we've had this amazing set of projects all sequentially. And it rarely ever happens in the life of a passive house consultant. You're here and you're there and you do all this work on one project and then you got to start over from scratch on the next. And with this group, we don't have that same kind of challenge. Um, so one of the lessons that I've learned is an obvious one and that gets talked a lot about a lot about on Accelerator, but it's the acknowledgement that further work is required to make sure that we align PHPP with Woofy Passive. This has really come to, to light with uh, Indwell. We, um, I really hope to do a presentation on this in the future, but Indwell has done an amazing thing in that they've let us do energy monitoring on 10 different multifamily projects and not just one meter, we have meters for almost all the end uses that match up to the energy model. Everything from clothes dryers to washers to their you know, commercial kitchens. And we're slowly going through, the data's coming in, we're seeing it and we're, we're tracking it versus the PHPP and Woofy models. And so I think there's a lot that Indwell is going to be able to offer the people on this call and uh, others in the passive house industry um, to help develop things. The second thing that I just, uh, I, I, I feel like is really important out of this learning experience is that uh, a good contractor is critical. And, and obviously that is a pretty uh, clear statement. I've worked with some really poor contractors that don't care, but Indwell has somehow found some really great contractors. And I think part of it's because they're going with uh, something along the lines of a construction management where um, they are interested in the project from the beginning of it, like very early and they're with us the whole way through. And anytime we have a technical challenge, they're bringing ideas. Um, the, the next one is uh, ERVs. Um, just a question there. I'm starting to question whether central ERVs are a good approach for multifamily. So we can talk more about that a bit later. Um, there's a couple interesting things that we're learning in Indwell projects. The other big lesson learned that we had very, very early was that we um, kind of gave into the temptation of going to very basic variable uh, refrigerant flow systems for heating and cooling. Um, the type that don't give you simultaneous heating and cooling and don't let you move heat around the building. Uh, that's something that I'd like to um, kind of talk about. We've learned our lesson. We're, we're going to be going with simultaneous heating and cooling ones in the future with, uh, with heat reclaim. Next slide, Emma. Trying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is the last one I just wanted to leave you with. And I got a couple interesting slides right after this. So the biggest thing is that 
I, I, I get, uh, it's interesting to see how each team works. And one common thing I see as a passive house consultant a lot uh, using PHI and, and both and FIAS is that each project seems to always want to start from scratch again and throw out all the ideas from other people and from uh, previous projects and come up with new great details. There are some exceptions, and this has been one of them, where the team basically just learned from their first project Graham started with, and we just went all through each project and we learned and we looked at the details over and over again. We asked the contractors what we needed to do better. We fixed them, we tried them on the next project, we tweaked it. And ultimately it's it's so much better now. There's less education required for the designers, but a lot on the site as well. People just know what to do now. And that just results in material and construction uh, optimization. So two good examples of that are um, the wall systems where we started our passive house journey with uh, build smart at first and that that wall system shows all sorts of potential um, and we did build the one project with it the second one which kind of started at the same time used the uh, the photo that you see there which was all exterior insulation uh, the product there is a green girt with six inches of uh, um, cavity rock rockwell cavity rock but we ended up through pricing and working with the contractors and finding out what they liked and didn't like about those projects, we ended up with this last system that Emma described from Equest and Lofts. And that one, we've just replicated it for nine projects. We've thickened the insulation, we've founded ways to optimize it, but it's a very cost competitive uh, wall system and we all know how to make it airtight. And uh, the next slide shows that. I just, I thought this slide was really cool. I, I took all the air tightness tests that have been done for the Indwell projects. And uh, what you see here is that their first test, which they do when the air barrier is complete, are the blue bars. The second test is after mechanical systems and most of the electricals in. There might've been a few exterior doors missing at the time. And the gray bars where they ended up in the end. And, and this, this graph is organized sequentially. So their first projects at the top, and they're next at the bottom. And the red dotted line is, is the passive house uh, target. So you can just see how great these contractors are doing. Their first tests are always below 0.2 air changes per hour. And they always end up less than the targets. And they're getting better and better each time. And that's because they know what to do on each project. And uh, we've just gained a level of comfort doing that. And the next slide is, is the same, just articulated as slightly different to the, the fee targets. Interestingly enough, some of the projects wouldn't meet the uh, FIAS targets, uh, but they did meet PHI. But anyway, just I thought that was a really unique thing that just showed how, how we all built as a team and, and where we are now. And Greg, that first one there is uh, it's a retrofit actually. So that one, yeah. you know, it was a complicated building. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Great stuff. So we'll dive into questions in a second. First, we're gonna go uh, back to Zach. All right, thank you. I just want to take a moment to thank the fine organizations that make our work possible here at Passive House Accelerator. So a big thank you to our sponsors. Our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our champion sponsors are Icon Windows and Doors, Prosico, and Siga. And our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you also to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Aero Barrier, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Enotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. So a big thank you to our sponsors. Thanks. Great stuff, great presentations. We got a good queue here of questions, so let's dive into it. Uh, again, thanks to, to Graham and Emma and, and Greg. Um, Mr. Melvin is up first. Melvin, over to, uh, to you. Melvin, I know you're there somewhere. Mm -hmm he can't speak oh i know because he's working in his office you know what tell adam to let you speak 
Um, Melvin's question uh, was, and I'll answer it for you, sorry. Uh, can Graham explain in more detail why a charity organization decided to pursue passive house certification, even though it has a higher capital cost? Sorry, lost my voice, so I can't speak. All right, Melvin, will you take care of your voice and uh, we'll put Graham on the hot seat for this first question. No, that, thanks for that question. Uh, I can still remember the day we were sitting in the office in, uh, in 2016 and there was a, leak, a news article came across some feed. Uh, Ontario plans to ban gas. You know, leaked cabinet memo at the premier's office says, uh, you know, that's it. And we thought, well, of course, everybody came. Oh, no, 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 no. That was just a hypo hypothetical thing. Like, what do we do to cut GHG emissions? And of course, it never happened. But we thought, well, dang, if we did have something like that happen, how would we respond? Because we're signing long-term contribution agreements regarding our funding, 20 years minimum, 30, 40, even 50 year agreements to lock in affordability. And if gas was banned, we'd have a huge retrofit problem that we wouldn't be able to pay for. And you know, if you know, if something maybe not as drastic as that happened, but something like a carbon tax or some sort of emissions pricing happened, we'd still be on the hook for all of those GHG emissions. And so we started saying, well, what, what do we need to do to protect ourselves and by extension protect our tenants from those kind of changes because they're likely to happen. And in fact, in Canada now we do have, you know, some, some start on carbon pricing. We're also a faith-based organization, do believe we have some sense of like ethical responsibility to the planet and to future generations. And so when we looked at ourselves in the mirror and looked at the future and said, circumstances could change our reality, we said, we need to do something better than we currently are to pres presuming that gas is good and, and is cheaper, so therefore better. And how do we get off of gas? And so we started making decisions toward that. We knew we couldn't get there in one fell swoop because we had no idea where to even start necessarily. Um, but over the last five years, we're now building buildings. Our first uh, uh, gas disconnected building uh, is about to open later this uh, later this spring in Hamilton. That's uh, 108 units in the first sort of wave, and then it will end up with 130, uh, 140 units, and there's no gas connection to that property. We had to actually pay the gas company to take the gas line away. Um, but we think that you know, those projects are now no more expensive to build than the other projects that we've been building uh, or things that we see in the marketplace. And in terms of operating them, they're not quite as uh, cost effective to operate as we model. And Greg can talk about sort of like the difference between the model numbers and the actual usage. But in the end, you know, if carbon pricing changes uh, any more or even dramatically more, uh, we'll be in good stead because we're basically isolated from uh, insulated from those cost increases related to GHG emissions. And it also allows us, because we've been able to put solar on our roofs, to start using a lot of our own power that we can actually generate. And so in a sense, you know, a sense, not we're not hydro independent or like energy independent, but we do, uh, we do have, um, we've made a lot of strides towards being able to actually just use the own energy, our own energy from what we can create on site. So in all those different ways, it, it, we thought, let's try this. We have the opportunity to do so because of you know who we are as people and uh, the organizational structure we had. Uh, my team, my leadership team has a lot of confidence in, in me and the, and the team we've built around us to build great buildings. And uh, we could build on that confidence and sort of bring the team, our internal team along with the journey, including our facilities operations team so that we can do, like Greg said, measure backwards uh, so or monitor backwards so that we can project forward uh, more confidently in the models. And so um, that was a bunch of the elements that led us to making this decision. The other thing is we also knew that we needed to try more than one project to say, oh, that was too hard or it didn't work. And we had to get past the, the learning curve. It might not be one project, like Emma said, it might be a couple of projects and it is quite steep on the first project, but by the second, third, fourth project, so many of the things we just don't have to relearn and we just presume and just keep moving forward. Wow, Greg. Well, you know what, on that point, so Melvin, great question because we got a fantastic answer. So on that, I think we should all unmute and applaud Graham and your team at Indwell okay. because we are lucky for you to take on these risks. Um, and again, uh, you know, Vancouver and Toronto have a lot of competitiveness, you know, um, and I really appreciate how uh, you put Hamilton on the map 
for Passive House. And uh, if it wasn't for, you know, a couple of those university projects, maybe there wouldn't be so much of Toronto. It would be more Hamilton. So bravo to your guys' work. And on that note, um, Greg, maybe you want to just comment a little bit about some of that um, pricing of the, you know, of the energy that Graham alluded to, just to kind of give us a bit of a, a discussion on that before we hop over to Jeff with his question. Sure. It, it wasn't necessarily um, pricing specifically. It was actually just um, in, interesting how the models are are different than um, what uh, is happening in real life on these projects. So the reason that's important for somebody like Graham and his organization is because a lot of times they're always trying to project, project for funding or for operation, how much it's going to cost to operate these buildings. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been, like I had said, we've been looking at these end uses on a very close scale month by month seeing how much uh, they drift from the model how close they are and i don't want to i don't have any huge uh, overarching numbers that i want to share at the moment now but uh, one interesting category is apartment use so we find if we're with using the phi system um, we're actually significantly underestimating how much each apartment is using in indwell's uh, group um, significantly Whereas if we use the FIAS numbers at the moment, again, on Indwell's projects and on their apartment size, we're almost bang on month after month. So just little things like that are helping us understand a little bit maybe where we need to tweak models so that they're more useful for the client and not just useful for certification. So, and like I said, I really want to do a presentation like that once we uh, get uh, maybe another year of data under all these projects. Hey, okay. Greg, mark it on your calendar, buddy. Uh, you know. January 26, 2023, we'll get you back. We might Sounds be like a plan. Time, but we'll, uh, we'll pin that in there. Sydney, put that in the calendar. Um, and Lloyd, you know, I got a bug, Toronto, Hamilton stuff. You know, it just, it's what banker rates do. So um, now we're going to move over to Jeffrey. So, uh, I think this is wonderful. And I'd like to focus on the learning aspect of going from project to project. Um, how do you integrate and, and how do you kind of institutionalize that learning into your design processes? I mean, do you have specific meetings? I mean, I know that, you know, you know, tip, I mean, is there a design charrette? Is there a postmortem to say what worked, what didn't? How do you deal with uh, changing, um, you know, uh, team members and participants? Is it always this, I, I can't always be the same contractors and subcontractors that are involved. Um, do you have any specific comments about, or, or lessons for us on how to like maximize that continuity of learning? I remember Greg, you go first and I can sure. learn that out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Jeffrey, I've got a, a couple of things. Mm -hmm. So when, when we first started on the journey, I remember when we all could meet in pe person, we mm -hmm. were kind of having like these little passive house charrettes you know, every design meeting, biweekly meetings, and it was the design team. But the one thing that was different is the contractor was always there. And that that contractor was so into it from the beginning. They It's not like they were just sitting there and always questioning the, the cause. They were into the game. <laughs> they really wanted to learn. And and so that, that attitude was there from the beginning and they were just included. They were at those meetings. They helped us uh, talk about what was feasible, what wasn't. And fast forward till now, um, just kind of glossing over a whole number of years, it's now at the point where we just know what's going to go in the drawings. We know what's in the specs. Um, we don't have to have those same meetings. We still we still do, but we don't have those same my minute details we're all worrying about. Um, and that's that's been a been a huge thing. But I think that the other thing you asked there was, is the contractor the same all the time? Um, fortunately, Indwell's been lucky enough to have some repeat construction managers and some really good ones. And they've sometimes repeated their trades, sometimes not, um, but we still have the passive host training presentations. We still do diligence uh, in design review, making sure all the details are up to snuff. And, and in construction, we're still doing comprehensive site reviews and multiple air tightness, as you've seen, just to make sure we're catching all those things. They still happen, just they're less intense than they used to be. Um, yeah, so I hope that gives a little bit of context. Emma, do you have anything to add? Um, just that. So one of this is a challenge for every um, when when you start to expand and get further away too. So um, while we've kind of stuck with the same um, two or three contractors when we're working in this region, 
um, Greg and I are working on some other projects that are further away and these contractors aren't going to be able to travel there. So we're going to be kind of restarting in these different regions with that education process, meeting the contractors very early on. Um, I feel like it's easier to train the, the design team, um, maybe because of the, the iterative process of our um, design meetings, but it's harder to train those contractors. So um, we'll start early. That, that's always our recommendation. Do you, at the end of the project, so I'm a big lean guy. And one of the things across all industries is that a key factor in learning is postmortems when the experience is fresh. You, you, you know, you, you say, hey, man, this thing, this worked great. This didn't, you know, it, this didn't work the way we planned it kind of thing. It's so, interesting. Yeah. Is there any, do you have anything like that in your process at the end of your projects, basically to, to, to document those things that worked that didn't work so that you're, you, you know, you don't forget. Yeah. I think that probably within the, each office is that they have a different way of doing it. But as a team, I can say that right now things are happening um, quickly enough yeah. on these projects that what happens, uh, Jeffrey, is like they'll learn something on one project we'll fact check it as a team and it'll go right away into the next project, even if it's a change or a site instruction and it'll go through all of them. <laughs> um, so we have that going for us that we're all going along on the same pace in the same direction. But but interestingly, you mentioned the postmortem. We just did have a, what, Graham, a four day. Two and a half day. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of Some meetings. Like four just, days, yeah. Yeah, just going back and thinking like, you know, what worked, what didn't, what do we need to change on the next one? So it, it probably happens haven't hasn't happened as frequently as we would have liked, but it has it is happening. And I think that that was especially that with our monitoring data, right? Um, yeah. To have a very useful. Now we're finally getting that feedback because for so many design decisions, we felt like, oh, we wish we knew what the actual impacts of this are going to be, but we won't know for another year. So we just kind of hope for the best. <laughs> but now we have a bit more data to back it up. And part of that postmortem is actually really hard to do right away because uh, the building gets set up, it gets the you know, everybody leaves, you pay the check, uh, the contractor then doesn't want to come back and the pumps aren't running right or whatever. And there is a long and seemingly torturous process of getting things actually running correctly. We realize that you need to actually have commissioning for these kinds of buildings because even those contractors who are conscientious and say they want to be involved and they love the concept and they really want to improve themselves still have guys on site who just got, yep, it's running, but it just meant they had the power to it. You know, the fact that the damper was in upside down or the outdoor air sensor wasn't connected, wasn't really their thing and they didn't check it. So yeah. those are things you don't always realize right away. And we've added commissioning, which is a $25,000, $30,000 expense, unfortunately, into the budget. So we make sure that the building as quickly as possible gets running the way it's supposed to and being designed. I think that the other part of the uh, operational um, postmortem is actually being able to compare one thing to another. And because we have had the fortunate opportunity to try a few different systems, we can say, oh, we don't like the way that that uh, you know, VRF system without heat recovery works. It's just too much of a pain. The lead leg, you know, balance, whatever doesn't work. And tenants complain about this or that. So we've been able to compare that to something else and say, but this other system works better. We're just, you know, the Minotaur got ad, advertised there at the break. We're using that system in our first building that's right now um, under construction in St. Thomas. And that's our first time using fully decentralized system. Whereas before we kind of followed the, the way of doing like fully centralized systems, but recent code changes in Ontario have now made smoke dampers mandatory. And those are really expensive for a basic, like inanimate piece of technology that if, if we're just putting 1200 bucks per unit into smoke dampers, maybe we take the same capital investment and put it into better technology that's unitized. So there's also those kinds of decisions that we've had to weigh up, sometimes on the fly, sometimes between projects. So do you have like, I mean, when you go into a project, do you have a base spec which kind of forms your starting point and then you're tweaking that and trying to improve that? Yeah, in general, yes. And we'll, we'll often say, we'll, we'll build this building. We have a program model in mind in terms of like the, who it's gonna house and size and style, et cetera. 
We'll also then say, oh, and we want to see such and such improvements on the last one. And and then we layer in a few different sort of expectations for the project that then we draw from the base specs. We don't have to rewrite those building wall systems. Or we don't have to rewrite the expectations on the, you know, energy, um, energy or systems within the suites or things like that. We can just draw from the, the catalog of experience we have. And I'll say share that experience with others. And we've been able to do that to say, hey, you know, we're doing a project maybe with the YWCA. You don't have to reinvent your, your, your approach. Just take a lot of these kinds of things and translate them over to you. And so hopefully some of that sharing uh, is, is transferable to other, other proponents as well. Great question, Jeff. We're going to uh, head over to Zach and then we'll come back to more questions. And we're going to, looks like people want to dive into some of the mechanical. So hold on. Over to you, Zach. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I've got some uh, uh, announcements to make about upcoming events and the current podcast episode. We've got a great interview by Matthew Cutler Welsh of Amy Tankard, who is the CEO of Passive House Institute New Zealand. They talk about um, her experience. Um, leading that important passive house organization down under, as well as uh, her experience with her own passive house. So please check out the passive house podcast to learn more. Tomorrow morning, bright and early on the West Coast, it'll be 6 a.m. On the East Coast, it'll be 9 a.m. And in the UK and Ireland, it will be 2 p.m. We're having episode four of the Building Performance Interactive. This is our UK and Ireland-based show. And this one will focus on super insulated airtight passive homes with timber frame construction. And it will feature a project uh, presentation by Lee Broomhall of MBC Timber Frame and Adrian Williamson of WM Design and Architecture. So I'll include a link in the chat in just a moment, but I hope to see folks there early in the morning if you'll join me. Should be a great show. So. Next week, this is momentous for us here at the Accelerator. We are making a big change and we are launching Passive House Live. So every Wednesday at this same time and this same Zoom link, we'll be presenting Passive House Live. And Passive House Live is a consolidation of construction tech, which has been on Tuesdays, and the Global Passive House Showcase, which has been on Wednesdays. And so we'll be presenting both of those under the umbrella of Passive House Live on the first and third Wednesdays of the month. We'll be doing a project showcase. And on the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month, we'll be doing the construction tech edition of Passive House Live. So I will include um, a calendar link for the next uh, many uh, weeks of, of Passive House Live, but rest assured that the same Zoom link that you've been using to join us here on the showcase will work uh, for this um, ongoing series of Passive House Live. So we're going to kick off this new series with the Project Showcase Edition featuring Ed May of Building Type. Uh, and Ed is a fantastic presenter, a really a gifted educator and practitioner of Passive House. And he'll be talking about 10 easy ways to ruin your blower door score and remedies. And he'll be drawing from project examples to, to illustrate those. So please join us next week for that. Then the week after, the we'll have a construction tech edition of Passive House Live on February 9th, and that will feature Kevin Brennan, who will be talking about smart air tightness strategies. You may notice an air tightness theme here. The, um, we're, we're organizing some of our programming each month um, based on a principle of Passive House. So February is air tightness month for us. Also, we're hiring. So we are hiring a coordinator slash event producer to work with me and the team. We've got a really exciting 2022 uh, uh, planned and we are looking for help to make it happen. So if you know somebody who's interested in helping us produce events and um, coordinating our work, please uh, direct them our way. I'll also include a link in the chat to the um, job announcement. I think that's it for me. So thanks. Let's get back to questions and answers. All right, first we'll get over to Bev for some final thoughts and then we'll dive into the after hour. Bev? So I'm serious about this challenge, guys. It's not that hard to do three lines of a thank you to somebody. And what I would say is just notice how happy it makes them. <laughs> back to the questions. 
Well, on that, I want to start off. Hey, it is a pleasure to work with Bev and Zach and the rest of the Accelerator team every week where we get to dive into the nitty gritty of projects and I get to be a bit of a sponge just soaking in all of what the presenters give. So thank you to all the presenters, which I think we're above 120. I can't remember the final number when you can, when you add the uh, construction tech events as well as the happy hour slash showcase events. It's great. And I'm very happy and I thank you all for joining us every week so that we can help spread it. But I do need you to also do some other homework. Not only do you need to, to uh, make sure you tell how great we are to your friends, you need to bring more friends because we're not going to get to the goals we need to do by ourselves. So your homework is to bring a friend so we can scale this up. So we are at the top of the hour. We're going to keep going with questions and keep uh, the team here as long as we can. But if you do need to go because you have an early start tomorrow, because, yeah, that 6 a.m. Pacific time is going to come quickly. We understand. Get your coffee ready and we'll see you tomorrow. Um, and if not, we will see you next Wednesday. You can have a Tuesday night off to get caught up in all the episodes you haven't been to for Passive House Live. So for those of you who need to leave us, good morning, good night, see you later. And the rest of us, we're going to keep going. And actually, you know what? We're going to talk a little bit about aesthetics, Lloyd. We had a question about paint colors. Lloyd? Well, yes, I, I, I saw this photograph. It flashed through tonight really quickly, but I saw it earlier when I was looking at the building and writing about it earlier that, you know, you had this apartment unit that was going to be occupied and any normal developer would have just painted it white and be done, especially in a passive house where the windows aren't that big. And here you have a black wall here and beige wall here, and so much care went into the color of it, into the interior setup of it. And I know this has nothing to do with passive house, but I just wanted to hear the thinking behind that. <laughs> well, I can try. So um, actually, because we've had so many projects um, kind of go through the design phases and um, we've named a term called indwell eyes. <laughs> so we've created kind of a, it's a contemporary color scheme that um, people um, like the tenants feel like they are living in a custom home, even though, you know, it's supportive housing is what we're building. But um, I think just by showing that level of care and giving individual individuality to each unit. Um, it makes a difference in how people feel about the space they're living in and how they take care of the building as well. I'll just well, add to that. It just, uh, it really changes the, the sense of one's place. And a lot of our tenants have experienced institutionalization or other kinds of, you know, very poor quality housing. Um, and so a decent paint job is something uh, that they really appreciate. Also, the apartments are modest in size, and so there are kind of tricks you can play in terms of like perception of depth and the width of the apartment, et cetera, by picking the right colors. And, uh, and we've realized that, that that makes a difference in how people feel about their home. And uh, in the end, uh, we all wanna feel at home when at home, so uh, the extra little bit of cost won't make a big difference. The second part of that, though, is to not overdo it. And we've seen buildings, you know, maybe by some other developers, where we're like, uh, you know, there's too much effort, too many tile patterns and all kinds of weird things that really make it like a jumbled feel. And so it's a fine balance to walk in that, uh, that sense of aesthetic quality. Now, do we pick every paint color correct that tenants love? Sometimes they ask to have it repainted, but the vast majority actually really like them. Well, thanks very much. That's like a great answer. I mean, I thought it was very impressive and I appreciate the answer. Well, Lloyd, and it's a good question, too, because ironically, in a segue, today in Canada is also Bell Let's Talk, which is about focusing on mental health and now the importance of that. So, again, we all know that we're all not alone. We can share and grow and connect with each other. But um, great that, again, we also have a day where we should be talking about everyone's health. And I really appreciate that that's part of your design aspect of ensuring the care, not just about the comfort and health of what the building is doing, but also that intricate part of the individual. So um, great answer. And again, Lloyd, thanks for picking up because, you know, we do need to recognize, you know, we're talking about comfort. We're also talking about our mental health and a lot of things. So um, absolutely. Thank great. you. No. Okay. Let's uh, head over to Kelly. Kelly, I, I hope you're still with us. I haven't checked. Um, you had a question. 
Kelly has left us, so I will figure out the question and we will move over to Bev, who had a couple of questions, comments. So Bev, your turn. Sure, well, Enrique had the same question, so I don't know if he's on still. He can ask if he wants. You're right, he did. And Enrique, are you there? Uh, that's okay, Bev, you can go ahead. I was uh, just curious about why the uh, centralized um, uh, ventilation system, you didn't find them uh, appropriate for a multifamily with those. Yeah, you teased us and then didn't tell yeah, us. Yeah, I know. I, I actually was really hoping that would tease you guys. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I would uh, I would start off by saying like this, it was obviously um, meant, to, meant to generate some conversation here. There are so many good things about a central system, especially when you're a passive house consultant and you're doing the modeling, right? There's great filtration. You can do post heating and cooling with a heat pump to temper air, which is nice. Um, you know, you get the benefit of uh, kind of less fan power, um, just so many good things about it. And we've used it for a long time now. Graham mentioned one of the reasons why we've started to have to question it. In Ontario, we have a very interesting rule change, which now requires fire and smoke damper, which means they need to install two of these very, very pricey dampers in every apartment. Um, you know, just, just to step back a second, these are typically one bedroom apartments. So we're supplying fresh air to their living areas and we're exhausting it from the kitchen and uh, bathroom. So we have one duct that goes into the units, one duct that comes out. Um, so as soon as that code change came into place, immediately these, the central system got more expensive uh, for us in Ontario. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason um, that we've started to, to relook at this is, um, is based on operation. So Graham mentioned that it, you don't get the building set up day one that also means that you don't learn how the systems act with tenants and so not in all the buildings and certainly not in all the buildings we as uh, zon work for have this problem but in in a couple unique projects smell issues have become a, a challenge um, and and we have a lot of dedicated individuals working on this trying to find it out and we know now it's not leaking from one apartment to the next um, and in one spe spe specific case, we um, are quite confident it, the smell is going back to the unit, transferred, even though there's supposed to be no transfer, and then coming back. And so it's not going to be a problem for everybody, but in a couple of unique cases, it's started to make us look again. And that's that's the honest answer. Um, and so as Graham mentioned, we, we have been forced in a couple cases uh, by the code to go for one ERV per apartment. And so we're just starting to get into that now. And there's obviously energy penalties of that and other penalties to doing that. Um, but it is a road we've just started on, like, what, about two years ago? And those are just being constructed now. So that's that was the, the full context to that. I'd be yeah, curious to know if other people have that experience, the smell transfer. Going with uh, one ERV for this, per apartment is a good solution uh, unless you have to dehumidify it because the uh, mm. problem is uh, the humidification is there and there is where a centralized unit. Certainly climate through. specific. Yeah, you're right. And it's yeah. specifically uh, smoking that we're really dealing with because uh, a lot of our tenants do do smoke and we do have non-smoking policy in our buildings, but many of our tenants, you know, are coming directly from street homelessness or other kinds of very precarious situations. And the, the last thing that they're really interested in doing is complying with our non-smoking policy. We meet people where they're at. We move people towards where they want to go, but, uh, you know, enforcing, you know, their housing around a non-smoking policy isn't our top priority. And so when we've had this ERV issue or this, you know, centralized ventilation, we're struggling with how to make, you know, the, the needs of the mechanical system outweigh the needs of the tenants. And so the other goals that we're trying to achieve and, so in recent projects, we've decided to switch to that uh, switch to the decentralized approach and give that a shot. All right. Thank you much. Bev, did you have any other questions? Or are you happy with what we just learned about? I'm happy with that. Um, it's interesting. Um, Peterson Engineering probably dominates the passive market in Massachusetts. They're very impressive. My favorite. Oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, they are definitely pushing towards semi-central. I don't think it's for the same reasons though. I think it's more about on the taller building, sometimes having trouble with yep. the pressurization or something it. like that. Yeah. Yep. 
that's certainly a, a real concern and one we did have we did have to work through uh, for sure but these the building mcquest and lofts we talked about was kind of at the limit where we're kind of comfortable going with a central feeding a couple floors down and still being able to balance it properly yeah mm -hmm. and i think everyone's doing doing these projects here in massachusetts is specking aero seal for sure for any ducting too that is a big lesson we learned early on. Yeah, we didn't get a chance to touch on that. We were trying to manually seal, and some projects are still trying to do that, but we did have to use aero seal in a, in a couple cases to meet the, the FIAS targets. But what was the tallest uh, building you uh, had the centralized ceiling? Well, the, the tallest operating one right now would be four stories. Um, most are three, I guess, Graham, but there We've will be- we five in the works, and yeah. probably- uh... Well, we had a 30 story on the drawing board, but that wasn't the, you know, the owner sold the property to somebody else, not us. So. Uh, again, great insight. And, you know, again, appreciate that you have enough of these buildings that you've played with to, to know the difference of where things work and um, great insight. Uh, a couple of questions that uh, people have left, and I think they're quickly answered. Kelly asked, is the rock wall installed over the zip system? And that's yes. Um, I will just chime in is, uh, again, I'm in BC where all of our rain screen is installed vertically. I saw the one horizontally and I cringed. Tell me what happened there and, and how did you get that approved? <laughs> okay. So it, we do have the corrugated siding in the front in front of that. So it's got its own kind of built-in drainage, right? That was why. Of course you snuck in a sneaky little detail to make that work. Okay, great stuff. Um, Jess, Jesse Walton just said, is the exterior stair structurally attached to the housing thermal envelope. Can you explain a little bit more of those details? Yeah, that, that was one of the, the really good thing about Indwell's team is they have an amazing structural engineer that just is willing to try anything. And that is a fully, I think you're talking about the balcony photo and it that is a fully know. detached structure from the main building structure. Uh, and the insulation goes right behind it and everything like that. So they did a really good job there. The one slight it, it learning did, there. It did move a bit. Sorry. Yeah, the one slight <laughs> learning is that the uh, steel yeah. frame doesn't doesn't move as much as the wood does, and yeah. so the wood yeah. four-story building had a slight amount of shrinkage, which did yeah. mean uh, you know a little bit of alteration there to the uh, door thresholds uh, was required. Yeah. Uh, interesting on the door thresholds. I know in Europe they again have some slots, so there's a little bit of slop in the connection for it to move. Yeah. But you're right on the stair thresholds when you need it to be pretty close to you know zero. So yeah. interesting insight there. Interesting point on that, Sean, is that the accessibility is one of the biggest things that we actually had to learn through this process and AODA and, and, and barrier-free standards here versus some of the barrier-free standards. Well, they're different in each jurisdiction, but a lot of the technologies coming from Europe are quite different when it comes to barrier-free. And so exterior doors, uh, commercial grade sort of aluminum doors is one area where we've gone to the best we can buy in North America, even though they're not passive house certified or yeah. anything simply because of when you add up power operators, thresholds, all of these other things, we just could not get a passive house certified, like commercial grade door that gets a lot of traffic. Well, it's a good point, Graham, and I'll just give a bit of a promo to one of our sponsors. I know Intertech has a really unique door that uh, Scott at Connerstone's uh, installing on his passive house and Rupert in 20 seconds. So um, connect with the team at Intertech, they might have some of your answers for you there. And good I know, know. Uh, Monty and uh, and many of the Passels consultants, they had a wish list about five years ago, and that's always been number one. And I think it, you know, it's kind of being solved, but again, di different designs between Europe and North America. And that kind of <laughs> leads me to, I think we've got, so then uh, Melvin had um, two questions and because he's got a sore throat, um, I did write them down somewhere on my screen. Where did I put it? Uh, oh yeah. Um, what is the difference between European and North American plug load habits that you've noticed in in between the models? And you know, again, we're a bit of uh, plug hogs here in North America. Greg, did you have any insights of, of how you model that? Well, I mean, we because uh, our two main reference points right now are, are Blossom Park, which was a PHI low energy building, and McQuest and Lofts, which was FIA certified, we, we didn't get any freedom on how to model plug load usage, right? We were set into that. So we didn't change anything in the PHPP model and we didn't change anything in the FIAS model. And it's just 
interesting that Fias had a, a greater allowance. They do different calculations, but they had a greater allowance, and that allowance that Fias is using seems to be more in line with what Indwell's tenants are using. And uh, there's probably a lot to unpack there. Like yeah. I know, um, you know, Fias, if I'm correct, is basing a lot of their data on research from Building America or research that was done in conjunction with that. So I think that probably has something to do with it, that their data was based on measured results in America. Um, and so that would make sense that they're probably closer to our lifestyle than, than wherever PHI gets theirs. Fair point. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other question he had was, I think it was more of just a, a question. Uh, have you heard of the SINAS report, which is an alternative solution to avoid smoke and fire dampers? I know Emma, you didn't know about yeah. it. You probably could hear about it. No, but... we'll we'll take a look though. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, my good good old friend Michael is chiming in on Bitcoin, which I appreciate. And I actually, Michael, I didn't ask the audience if they are joining you or if if they're all headed to the A C sorry A H R Expo. Uh, Michael, if you want to put us put the info of where that is, so we can hang out in your hotel room and. Uh, meet you later for poker you let us know where that event is and and we can check it out uh, i'm not going because i didn't even know about it but i know it's something related to mechanical and you can chime in it at some point and let us know what it's all about uh moving along uh mary james talking about prefab over to you mary hi i just wanted to um hear whoever wants to talk about it uh kind of explain your thoughts about why you worked with the prefab assembly on one project and then chose not to on your other projects. Um, should I take this one? Yeah, you go ahead. I'm oh. here, Emma. Yeah, so um, we we actually really enjoyed working with the build smart system, um, but it's coming from across the border <laughs> and in Kansas, it's really far away. So I think, um, in the end, it was uh, more expensive than um, if we were able to manufacture something locally. Um, so that that was the main reason. And so we've tried to have something similar be adapted um, here in Canada um, and haven't found anything at that scale yet. Um, so that that's the main reason. We've looked at other options. Greg and I are working on a project that's um, likely going to be nine stories modular steel steel frame. Um, so we're looking at other um, prefab options, but um, often they're, they seem to be more expensive, even if they are made locally. So um, we just haven't had to do that yet. I'll add to that just a little bit. I mean, uh, aside from the exchange rate, which is always something that's hard to, to nail down between when you spec a project, when you actually go to price it, um, the other challenge that we had with the with that system, it wasn't with the Boston, wasn't with the Build Smart system at Boston Park. It was with the contractor's attention to detail, and particularly the foundation contractor paid no attention to detail, and we ended up with like one two inch sort of gaps, waves in the foundation wall being plumb, uh, well sort of being level. Part of me, and so we had to do a lot of on site shimming and, and adjusting for the uh, for the you know manufactured panels. That also led to um, the phasing of the project. The when when the contractor, which was, you know, promised that they were very experienced, but just put their weakest guys on the job. Uh, when they actually went to assemble the building, there was a lack of attention to keeping it watertight. The actual building, you know, wall assemblies, and because all of the insulations there, the windows, everything else like that, we did end up getting water saturation within the panel which you know, we were able to dry out due to some valiant efforts, but they took a, it took a lot of time to figure out solutions that we probably caused ourselves you know, collectively as a team by just not paying attention to the details, reading the, you know, the installation manual thoroughly, all that kind of stuff. So that has nothing to do with the BuildSmart system. It had to do with in, you know, inexperience with a prefabricated wall, wall assembly. And uh, it presents a barrier, I think, for... Um, for our scale of projects, putting up that that kind of uh, that kind of system in maybe our in our climate, we would try it again if we could, and we would even work as Emma said with a local wood manufacturer who was wanting to put the system together. But market demand just wasn't isn't quite there yet. They even went down to Build Smart and toured their factory, and we're trying to partner and you know, bring the technology here, but just hasn't happened quite yet. 
about Graham and Emma. I think we could have a whole night talking about prefab. Yeah, you're hitting my my stuff that I love, and I'm like, anyhow, we'll get there. I know there's some old school prefab companies that are just doing regular walls, and they could easily do what you, what you need, but getting over a bit of that hump price wise to make it happen. Mm-hmm. So. Um, well, everybody, I think we fired through the questions pretty quickly. If I if I missed anything, please raise your hand or you can jump on in. Well, I have a, another question that's not, uh, this is more for Greg. Um, did you find the process between certifying for PHI or certifying for FIAS, any lessons there about the differences in that process, those processes? Yeah, there's, yeah, I'll be very honest there. So uh, there's, there's a lot of differences. And I, I, uh, I should say that I am, we practice with both rating systems. So I'm kind of dual certified, if you want to call it that. So we, we switch between PHI and, and FIAS. Um, there are things that I like about both systems. Um, I think that FIAS really opened our eyes uh, about how organized they are right now. Uh, Graham said it right off the bat, the building got occupied three months later, they were certified. It's so so clean and so fast. Everybody kind of knew what to do. Um, that was really nice, and we had so much. Like, like for those who who haven't went through certification yet, one thing that FIAS does differently than PHI is that all of the design review for them is done in house. So so basically, you're always going back and forth to FIAS. So if there's a technical problem that comes up, you find out from FIAS pretty quickly, um, and they have very planned and laid out. Um, ideas of when things should happen and they communicate those expectations to you and they get them back to you. So that that design, that the ability to communicate directly with FIAS and design is a real strength that they offer. Um, the thing that's different about them in construction than the PHI is that there is a lot more documentation and a lot more testing that FIAS requires than PHI. And when you go through your first one, you start to really realize it. And and I don't know if Kathleen's still on the call, but Kathleen from RDH was our verifier. And there's a lot more stuff you got to worry about, more checklists, more things to look at, more photos to take, uh, more things for them to submit. And and that comes with a a higher cost. You know, you need a verifier to to do that construction part. That's a third party from the team. There's a fee to them. And, And PHI doesn't have that set fee. There's still testing that happens with the PHI project, but in my experience, there's a lot less of it. And that construction aspect of testing at, by a third party is, is less. Um, contrast that with PHI. PHI in our experience, and I, th- I don't know if we've just not got into a great connection yet with um, certifiers, like we've, we've played with a few different ones. Uh, they've all given us great advice. Uh, and so again, PHI, what they do is they have certifiers in your different countries and the certifier works with you in design and construction. And they're the ones judging the team's work. And they're very knowledgeable here in North America. We have a lot of great teams. Um, but the difference that I've been finding is that if a weird thing comes up that's not standard, then they're, they have to go back to Germany and you got to wait. Or, or, or Austria or wherever, you, there's that dialogue is very slow. And when we hit that with um, Blossom Park, and I've since went through that with a couple other projects, it just, it can, it has the potential to, to grind a project to a halt. So if I can send any wish out there right now, I really, really wish that we could streamline um, the PHI process upfront in North America faster so that certifiers get faster support and can get their teams moving along quicker like this. So I don't know, I, I, that was kind of me rambling, Mary, but I hope I threw a couple points in there that might be helpful. Oh, that was great. Thanks. Yeah, yeah Greg, and like anything else, we all deserve feedback, you know, we all can yeah. improve one. So it's, it's great, great feedback. So appreciate it. So Greg, it almost sounds like the construction verification that you think that FIAS requires, some of it's not that helpful. It, it's I mean, not I that personally, it's... like I see, I've, you know, I worked in affordable housing. We'd go for yeah. refinance and like there's rotting sheathing and mold and like yeah. things weren't built the way the architect told them to do it. And so like, I love construction verification, but like yeah. I don't do it too, so. Well, I'm not saying it's not it's not good. So there is a, a really clear thing I kind of omitted there. So in the US right now, a lot of you have to do different requirements. You have to do energy star checklists. Um, 
you might have to do the EPA, uh, you know, indoor plus uh, program. In Canada, we don't have to do that. So there's been a learning curve for us um, to do those types of things. It's not that we ignore them. It's just that these checklists and finding people that want to check them off. And then there's the whole thing about low emitting materials. Like a lot of people don't know that FIAS certification requires low emitting materials. They're not hard to find in the U.S., but they certainly are in Canada. All the yeah. the requirements and certifications are very different. And composite wood was a nightmare on McQuest and Lofts because you guys have slightly different certification stamps on your things than we have in here. So we were always back and forth with FIAS, and and we'll we'll make it better. We'll we'll address that. It just was one of the first Canadian FIAS projects. Um, and so it was just a learning curve. So it's not that it's not necessary. It, it's all very good things. And Theus had a couple other cool things that Indwell's decided to pick up, like compartmentalization testing for apartments. That's something Indwell never did when we were doing PHI. That's required for Theus. And they've wanted to do that now from, from now moving forward, even though we're not certifying each time. So they are more onerous. Contractor complained. I stressed out a lot. But we're all good now. And I think we know what we're we're doing <laughs> but other than the expense and yeah. the checklists which aren't intuitive because of the canadian versus the american thing the amount of like blower door testing and photos i guess the documentation sounds like it's a higher level too it, there's a higher level yeah i mean you've got a spot check uh you know flow rates and there's just just things like that hot water demand tests but they're all good you know they're kind of commissioning that's kind of the way we right. view it it's, right. it's, it's a commissioning process yeah, it's interesting, Greg, you talk about the commissioning and, you know, it's it's like that third party quality control. And yeah. in your case, when you just sum it up on that very end of commissioning, it just makes sure that you're setting up that building for the occupants as best they can. And, you know, Greg, you spoke about the, um, you know, being able to go back and, and have that continuous improvement approach. Well, it, it has to occur at a certain time frame when you've got the great data. And then at the same point, Greg, you've got all this data you're collecting to, to kind of figure out, okay, when can you review it and say, hey, we, we've got data to, to look at. So um, yeah. a lot of great things that you guys have implemented and, and then be able to discuss. And um, and again, so you presented here tonight and what a great evening it was with just the experience you've brought and the examples you've brought. And uh, again, I appreciate you guys putting in the number. I put it, we, Harvey wasn't here tonight, but usually Harvey's always asking about the cost. And so we, you're able to shut him up pretty quickly and, and make sure that <laughs> that wasn't a discussion. And uh, again, it's great that you're talking numbers. And yes, everyone, you know, these are Canadian numbers. So some Americans would be like, hey, that's that's pretty affordable now. Well, they're working hard to get these numbers down. So, mm -hmm. well, I think everybody, um, again, if there's no other questions, we have another big Thursday. Not only do we have an early morning here on the, uh, the West Coast, if you've uh, signed up for day two of the uh, PHN's Wood Symposium, um, there's that going on. Um, and then, you know, we've got Mark and Dave with BS Fridays on Fridays. And then next week we give you Tuesday off. So you can, you make sure you can rest, rest up on Tuesday and you can show up tomorrow. So, uh, I know I have some homework. I've actually missed the interactive number three. So I got homework tonight before I can watch number four tomorrow. So, um, I think I want to wrap it up because, uh, I got homework to do. So, um, Emma, Graham, Greg, can't thank you enough for uh, for again, you know, the the details and again, great slide deck. Um, again, Thanks, can't wait for, uh, for for seven days to, uh, to to send a few of these to send your slide deck out to a few people. It was great, great insight. Um, Bev, Zach, any other closing uh, things I missed? No, thank you, everyone. This is really a wonderful night and great discussion. Really interesting, particularly oh this. This after hour. Sorry, I am in a very loud environment here, so I'm gonna meet myself. But thanks, everybody. So, so Zach, I, I, I keep talking about it, you know, about passive fight club, where we don't need to talk about passives anymore, because one, the phrase doesn't work out well, and we all like the benefits. Well, it sounds like Zach actually does have passive fight club going on in his house right now. So, um, that being said, uh, again, enjoy your Tuesday evening. We got our good old friends from across the pond. So, John, the rest of uh, our Kiwi and Aussie friends, uh, enjoy your Thursday morning, enjoy your coffee, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning for some of us early and for some people a little later in the day. But whatever time zone it is, see you tomorrow, folks. Great. Enjoy your night. Thank you, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks.